what it is what's up got your podcast on the cut um or really this could be podcast length i hope it isn't but uh this is a continuation of my uh, house of the dragon content you know this is a good episode when wearing a shirt in a video because normally especially in this fucking heat lamp that is a shitty apartment in the deep south in the middle of summertime hot as fuck that light is hot as fuck but what else is hot as fuck? Uh, this dynamic between the greens and the blacks. So unlike some of these previous episodes and previous uh, seasons, what I'm going to do here, I took down all of these notes. I have 31 bullet points. I believe like 40 minutes ago I had 18. So only about 8 or 9 additional ones here. Oh, actually that would be about 18 minus 31 would be 4. 14? 15? 15? 13? 13. Um, 13. But I'm going to just list these off. It's in chronological order, of course, so it should be pretty coherent. If you like this format, or you just want to see my old ones, I can maybe throw the old ones up here somewhere, where it's just me, like, literally rambling about the episode, still in chronological order, but basically rambling about what I liked about it. But I think this might be a little more fluid. All right, so just my notes here, season two, episode one. Um, like the new intro, uh, so the intro here, I think, tells a story of what's to come, you know, all of the intros usually do, like, little small predictions on what's coming, I think season 8, Game of Thrones, gave, like, a piece of what was happening, and then progressively added more as we got through a season, I believe that's what happened with that one, and, um, I don't remember season 1, and it's too, too much, but... This one felt very apropos. I mean, it's just a huge amount of imagery between the greens and the blacks. Uh, how, you know, the thrones are split and how the common people kind of get fucked over. I think there's a little bit of that in the whole, like, quilt blanket thing they do. Um, I thought it was very, you know, even though, I guess I should mention this, uh, HBO fucking sucks. Uh, I'm on the same plan I've had from I don't know how long. And now it has ads. It's, um, instead of 4K, it's 1080p. And Dolby Atmos is removed, I understand. So, I'm paying the same amount, but, like, they stripped the features down. So, fuck HBO. Fuck David uh, Zaslov. I can go fuck himself with a fucking, uh, the shit that Blood had stick and the, for catching rats. He can go fuck himself with that. Uh, so, the in new intro, even though in inferior quality, about 1080p, looked good to me. And I like the imagery there. And, the, you know, dragons colliding and then people... Like, dragons collide on both sides, and then people are in the middle of it. So, kind of fits how we understood uh, the whole dance of the dragons to play out, you know, centuries later, as is kind of briefly explained in Game of Thrones. Speaking of Game of Thrones, uh, so we got a Night's Watch slash Stark opening, which was just crazy to me. Uh, someone said on, on a KTT where, you know, I was posting it, kind of seeing the thread there, um... They thought they were, like, watching uh, a Game of Thrones episode, but I asked it. I mean, you get the beautiful, like, kind of winter imagery that we haven't seen in now five years, 2019. Uh, the last time we've seen The Wall was 2019, around a month ago, five years ago. So, actually, more recent than that. But, yeah, so, we get the North, uh, we get the Night's Watch, and they kind of go through the whole, like, honor and all that bullshit. Um... And we got a Stark talking. Uh, this one, I, I think his name was Carcass or whatever the fuck. I probably should have wrote that down. Um, but Carcass, we'll, we'll call him C Stark. C Stark. Uh, C is talking to. Uh, I told myself, I don't have to remember this because one of the two are gone now. I believe the one that's remaining is just Sarah's, and Lou Sarah's is the one that got fucking, you know. Uh, so, just Sarah's is walking around with our, our guy. Uh, Big Stark, who's effectively like, he seems to. I think he he is actually like a king because I mean you can't be royalty and be part of the Night's Watch. Like you have to just shed all of your allegiances and all that stuff. You're gonna be part of the. You can't have both basically. That's really the whole thing that happened with John Stark or John Snow and the fucking you know the throne thing with Aegon Targaryen. Uh, so that that right here. I believe that he's just, like, Prince of the North, or King of the North, something like that. Um, so, he basically 
this like they had some times where they threw flash forwards towards Game of Thrones and they they do their best to like subtly tie in Game of Thrones to House of the Dragon. And essentially this whole like almost all of this was just like you're welcome, you know, here's Game of Thrones stuff. Uh, you know, mentioning what's past the wall is death. Uh, mentioning how dragons are afraid to go past the wall because they, you know, they're magic, so they know what's out there. You know, the magic force, magical forces out there. Um, you know, the the predictions that you know the predictions that Viserys seems to be maybe only Targaryen, other than his daughter, can really hold dear, at least that we've seen so far. And then um, another another important thing we've always like really heard. From like the Stark perspective, like how much the uh, Southerners and especially like the higher ups really don't appreciate the threat, the gravity of the Night King and everything he has going on there—the Ice Walkers or White Walkers, not Ice Walkers. Um, so we get to see how that presented even as far as 300, 400, however many hundred years ago. So even a Targaryen that has possession of a magic ability, which is those dragons. Even they didn't really uh, feel the gravity of what was out there. So it's just good kind of seeing like we have fire. We have almost everything being southern based. And it's kind of cool to just see a little bit of what we used to have. The the the, the Ets that we really still kind of miss in the day. The, the Starks. So I just put down. Is this Luke's heirs? I realized this is just heirs. Luke. Got ate up, so I just remember that. Uh, I love setting the tone for Southerners and trusting the deaf. Not trusting the deaf, so yeah, that's just what I mentioned about people from, you know, King's Landing or whatever, just not trusting what's beyond the wall. Uh, love, Rhaenyra's, and Damon clashing. So this is just stuff that I enjoy. I mean, I, I thought there was really good dynamics between Damon and uh, his brother. And, you know, just brief moments of, like, Rhaenys and kind of the elder... Uh, Targaryens in the room, kind of like having differences of opinion to her. Um, she's just a very every time she's in a scene, the words that come out of her mouth are seem very like important. Like her statements, how her perspective on things are. I know she's not perfect. There's no perfect perspective. Like, there's no this character is telling the course of events that's going to happen. Like, that never happens in the series. There's always a flawed perspective. Um, at least to a certain degree, like, you may have it to where, you know, like, you have... Even Bran Stark, like, you know, some things went different than kind of how he kind of foresaw them happening. Um, but Rhaenys is obviously like, the wisest Targaryen alive at this point. I would say even when Viserys was alive, she was still, like, just way more... Um, you know, just kind of more bird's eye view than I think he had. Although, obviously, her perspective, she's more of an advisor. Like she's not an, an, a doer. She's like just a see what happens, she kind of give opinions of what's happening. So, she she has that while Damon is impulsive. Uh, very similar to his anagram, uh, Aemon, in a lot of ways, honestly. They're, they're very similar characters, which, you know. I haven't read the book, but... <laughs> um, so... You know, you don't have to read the book to understand. Like, this series is obviously pitting Damon against Aemon. We've even seen it multiple times to this point. Well, at least we've seen it once in a very big moment to this point. And, you know, obviously the end of this episode. Um, so, yeah, Rhaenys is very calm. Uh, I just wrote down as a, as a bullet point. Uh, Damon's impulse will eventually catch up to him. I think what this episode did really well is that it's trying to show that these... Very flawed people that have, you know, the type of flaws that in Game of Thrones got people like fucking killed. Like no matter how how much smarter you thought you were than other people, very loud flaws usually get you killed. And what we're seeing with this one in particular is that there's a lot of characters with very loud flaws. I don't always think that that was the same for Game of Thrones. Like I I don't think like Arya Stark had like some just fatal flaw you know she was a little bit too um too, like out there like she didn't always think about the long term but 
the way the story works is that like she always going to have people that thought for her. Um, she just needed to be in the right presence, basically, until she was ready to, you know, finally see the longer viewpoint. And once she got to that point, she was pretty much good. You know, obviously Arya didn't die. So um, this story is showing you um, basically the strongest race, like power wise of, of people uh, this world has ever known the Theor Targaryens and how a people that were that powerful still ended up being, I guess, one and a half to, depending on how you look at it, one and a half or two Targaryens remaining by the time we got to where we got to. Um, so it's kind of trying to show you like how people that powerful still fucked up. So if you're going to have that be the end prerogative, then it has to be a thing where they had to be really fucking stupid. And uh, there's a lot of smart people in this in the series and we saw in this episode, but it's a lot of people, a lot of uh, very loud character flaws, and he was get you killed in this world. So Damon's impulse, I think, is his biggest one, and just his kind of um, you know, just he just a blinder sometimes, tunnel vision. Um, love this sodden uh caked face of uh Nair. So we first see Renair where she's on a mountain, kind of looking as we find out looking for the body or so some kind of confirmation that Lucerus is actually dead. Um, as we kind of got the end of um, the last episode of first season, it was uh, one where, you know, they did make sure to show like actual um, remnants of his dragon after being chomped up, like falling down. So it wasn't just like a thing where uh, Vagar, the super dragon, ate all of him. I guess some of him left. And, um, well, I'll just wait to get to the point later. But basically, she's looking for that. I just love, like, how raw and, like, I don't want to pray per se, but, like, just how, like, she's more focused on this than anything else. Like, there's nothing else that matters. The world, the war, um, Aemon potentially looking for her or anybody else potentially looking for her. Like, there's nothing else that matters. It's just start trying to find her son by any means possible. And in this world, we're, like, so many things had stakes before she left. To just be able to drop that for her son is um, probably going to be a character flaw for her. But I think also a very impactful thing there. And I, th I think it kind of speaks to... A lot of moments here kind of speak to like kind of the younger version of these characters. Especially for uh, Allison and um, and Renair. Like this is... She's a very... Um, very locked in person. When she kind of focuses on something. But she's very emotional she's very emotional and uh she has some moments here that would make you think of like younger you know, millie alcock renera just remind you of them now this is the same person it may be uh someone who's been through a lot more shit just then but still the same person um let's see alan is a real in um so i mean you see my color like i could say the n word here like, he's a real n word with the a not the er i'm not pretty venti um, but <laughs> can I tell you off a yeah, little tangent? I'm just gonna say this here. You you think like Brittany Venti like says in word like the way out to the in word? I don't think she does. I think I say a little bit clearer than she would. Anyway, uh, Alan realized uh in so I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, I have a couple like just a, a few like small points. Not all these points are just massive. I know it's already like 13 minutes. I'm only on my eighth point, but it's gonna be a lot smaller. Uh, the greens emblem. Uh, cool. I, I liked it. It was you see on the shields of the people kind of walking into uh, what I guess was King's Landing or the the Red Keep specifically, um, and you see like the emblem on the shields. I kind of like the uh, those arrows barely worked versus Danny. So the uh, scorpions. The first time that Daenerys like kind of just like kind of just flows in, just walks through, you know, onto King's Landing when she had the two dragons. Fine. Okay. Just perfectly fine. And then they do like the reinforced scorpion and like that, like because of like John and Danny like flirting or whatever, just her not paying attention, it clips one of the dragons. Like it hits him one time and then the second time it hits him with the fucking neck, he's just out of there. That's the only time we even see any vari variation of the scorpions work against any dragons, as I recall. I don't remember working it in any other situation. So when she comes back, like actually locked in, um, that remaining dragon, 
like fucking just murders everything. The bells, fucking kills everything. So I don't, I don't think the scorpion is gonna work against the fucking dragon. But I think it's kind of like a it's a a pro you know preventative. Like even though it shouldn't really prevent shit, but because we saw it in prevent shit. Aemon has a son, Jaehaerys, with his sister. That's what I wrote down on. I wrote down on the piece of paper. Aemon has a son, Jaehaerys, with his sister. My sister's name is Helena, which I fucking forgot because I didn't. I barely registered her name was Helena in the first place. I fucking forgot it back then in the first season. So, Cold World, Return of Cold World. Shout out Cold World. Cold World, fuck Allison and Rhaenyra. Shout out Cold World. Cold World, fuck Allison and Rhaenyra. I just want to say that one more time. Cold World, <laughs> Christian Cole. This dude so far, even though he is a spool or a spool, but um. Spiteful little B I T C H. I don't want to get you know fucking demonetized, whatever. Um, that's still burnt by how the Renera thing went. He's a real N I G G A. I gotta say that, man. I really gotta say that. Have fuck both of them. Like, you, let me tell you right now if Laris was in his position, the fucking one foot fucking uh imp, he would not have fucked Renera or Allison. So. You know, just take that to mean what it means. Um, that a Christian Cole. Um, auto sauce of coal. So that was um, some, just something I wanted to note because when they come into the um, the little uh, the the keep what, what, what the fuck the small council when it comes to the small council you have to wear uh, he gives just a little bit of cleanness like just side eye towards auto or. Towards Cole is Cole's work walking by Otto, so just keep that in mind. Um, it may not matter long term, but we'll just have to see. But he spends like him being Otto spends that meeting kind of like at least part of it just eating into Allison. So he may just be disappointed about Allison or lack of like she's not on the ball, you know, she's not really focused as much as she should be on the big shit, at least from Otto, Otto's perspective. Like Otto has been thinking about this shit from the beginning of the series, like just long term. Ever since there's been an opportunity for him to be little finger, he's been little finger. So, yeah, he's all played all this stuff to work in certain succession, and I don't think he always feels like she, actually he's pretty much said it. He doesn't always feel like she's really working towards the ultimate goal that at least that he's working towards. So, he actually says that in this episode. So, it may not be a long term thing, but he's definitely suspect of uh, the Cole and uh, Allison relationship. 